What's shaking, everybody? You're listening to Improv Tabletop, the Fate RPG actual play where we make up everything on the spot. I'm Ned Wilcock, your host and GM, and today I'm joined by... Caleb Anderton, on the first light of the fifth day, baby. Christian Randall, the last star to die. Thomas Ryan, I finished reading The Fellowship of the Ring for like the 15th time about 30 minutes before we started recording. <laughs> yeah. Yes! Now, before we get too much further, I just want to remind our listeners how we end up with our campaign suggestions. <laughs> These are suggestions that we receive from our listeners, and they are voted on by our patrons. So keep in mind, this is what you wanted. Um, <laughs> you specifically asked for this, guys. So we have today, the, the prompt that we have received from our patrons is Lord of the Rings, but you all play as early 2000s Cartoon Network characters. So the thing about that, it's a bit of an abomination. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I love Lord of the I, Rings. I think we all, I mean, we're all doing a podcast where we play make-believe. We definitely are Lord of the Rings people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could we get someone who's more, because this is where I'm going to fall short, in the Cartoon Network specifically, cartoons. What what kind of a list does that even look like to pull from? Well, hold on to your shorts. I happen to know a few. Okay. <laughs> I'm in the same boat. I need a list, guys. I don't think I watched any of these. Here it goes. I'll just... The ones that I can think of off the top of my head, I'm sure I'm going to miss a couple. Um, first, Codename Kizak Store. Never saw it. I saw an ad for it once. <laughs> Samurai Jack. Nope. Looks good. It is good, first of all. <laughs> um, Courage the Cowardly Dog. Okay, looks scary. Yeah, I was always too freaked out by that to watch it. Oh, my word. You guys... Um, Powerpuff Girls. Powerpuff Girls, obviously. I've seen some. I've seen some episodes here and there. I, I have not. I saw it like maybe playing in the background at a friend's house or something, <laughs> but I've never watched it. Uh, the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Nope. Is that the one with Death? Yeah, yeah. The Grim Reaper. I've seen clips. They've got that big nose thing going on. Yeah, that's Billy. Yeah. Nope. I've seen none of these shows. Wow. Dexter's Laboratory. Dexter's Johnny Lab. Bravo. Johnny Bravo. Teen Titans. I saw at least. An episode of Dexter's Laboratory and an episode of Johnny Bravo, respectively. Good heavens. For sure. At least one. Okay. Well, <laughs> here, here's what I'm going to say. We, when we take a suggestion for improv, we're, we're starting to get into our ideations here. The idea is we talk about our experiences with these things. And then based off of those experiences, that's how we inform our characters. So we'll see if uh, maybe some flexibility needs to come into play. I know <laughs> it might not meet exactly the prompt, but uh, we'll, we'll see what we end up with. We'll get adjacent. Yeah. So I guess let's slide right into these ideations here. And I guess I'll start off with my experience with Cartoon Network. Now, I was a PBS kid growing up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had just basic channels. We didn't have cable. But one of the coolest things for me was during the summers when I was younger, uh, I would get to go and hang out at my dad's office because I was off of school. My dad worked in academic technology at the local university, so he had all kinds of cool tech stuff that I could play around with, uh, get onto the computers, watch TV in particular. There is this conference room just down the hallway from where his office was. He has retired, but he had the same office for like 36 years. And just down the hallway from that office, was a conference room, which if it wasn't being used, my dad was like, hey, conference room is yours. There was a big old projector with a smart board. Ooh. I could get cable TV on there. I could get, I could project the computer on there. And so I was living pretty during those summers in like <laughs> my preteen years. Wow. So that is when I would watch Cartoon Network. That's when I would go to cartoonnetwork.com and play like all of the Flash games on there. <laughs> oh, the Flash games are awesome. <laughs> yeah. I remember my favorite one. Well, there were a couple that I really enjoyed. There was the Kids Next Door one where you would go and you would fight all of the bad guys. There was this one where it was the same game, but reskinned. They had one version that was Ed, Ed and Eddie and one version that was Thundercats. But in the Ed, Ed, and Eddie one, Ed, like, single D, he swallowed a tainted jawbreaker. And then you had to go into his body to destroy <laughs> the tainted jawbreaker. Uh, wild times. So, yeah, my I did not have as close of an experience with Cartoon Network uh, when I was young. But I really relished the experiences when I did get to watch it. Um, oh, another fun thing. When my brother got a Game Boy Advance, we got some of the Game Boy video cartridges. And I would watch, like, Dexter's Laboratory on the Game Boy Advance good old times now moving into lord of the rings which is definitely something that i'm much more well connected with uh from my childhood 
Uh, my first exposure was the Rankin Bass adaptations of The Hobbit and The Return of the King yeah, in cartoons. Too, man. Yes, yeah. yes. It was specifically The Hobbit. I never watched the other ones. Yep. <laughs> they were phenomenal. The animation was great. They had the musical numbers in there and everything, the ones that Tolkien actually wrote into the books. So I long had this love for the stories. And when the movies were coming out, uh, they were PG-13, and I was too young to go and watch them in the theaters with my dad and my brother. But I remember that was like a big thing every summer for those few years when they were coming out. My brother and my dad would go to watch the new Lord of the Rings movies in theaters because he was a few years older than me. The first PG-13 movie that I saw in theaters was Revenge of the Sith. Nice. Um, but that, that's another thing, though, because when, when I finally did get the chance to watch the Lord of the Rings movies, my neighbors had purchased all three extended editions on DVD. Oh, yes. And so during one blissful summer after I turned 13, we borrowed all of them from my neighbors, and I watched every single feature on every single disc Dang. of those extended DVDs. Wow. Yes. That's a lot of content. Yeah. Yeah, I was getting deep into like the Weta Workshop, like mm -hmm. as they were coming up with the designs for all the different swords, going into all of the fun, like little backstory things of when Orlando Bloom had broken his arm, but they needed him to jump up onto the horse. So they CGI'd it and everybody was like, this looks so great. You can't even tell. <laughs> and my childhood, especially as like, as I was hanging out with my neighbors was very much like Lord of the Rings. Redwall was another big thing. Yes. We'd get together and we we would grab sticks from the trees across the canal behind our houses and we would carve swords. We would decorate them with duct tape and electrical tape and all kinds of stuff. And we would have our own like grand adventures in our backyards. So that was very much like what I would do when I got home from school is I was just immersing myself in like my own fantasy, I guess essentially LARPing at that point, <laughs> though I didn't have a word for it. This uh, definitely led into my love of D&D &D and similar products, but I didn't rewatch the films for whatever reason until, you know, just this past couple weeks preparing for this campaign. What? Like I watched them the first time when I was a teenager and for whatever reason, just never got back around to it. What? You're, this is blowing my mind, Ned. I'll, I'll get into that in my ideation. Yeah, this. So the surprising thing coming back to these movies, there, there were a few things that I really appreciated getting back into actually watching the movies. First and foremost, they hit so much harder when you're not a dumb teenager. <laughs> yes. Reasonable, yeah. Because in like the, I don't know, 17-ish years, I guess it would be since I last watched them, uh, I've come to understand a little bit more about what it means when these people are sacrificing and giving of themselves in order to help the fellowship. You start to look at Boromir and be like, man, oh. I kind of get where you're coming from oh. and I feel for you. <laughs> these moments where like it means so much more, it connects so much harder and makes you realize, holy cow, I understand now beyond just the awesome fights and the world building and the design and the cinematography, why the story is so impactful and has survived all these years. But kind of the other flip side of the experience was, man, it gives me so much more motivation to tell awesome stories as a GM because those movies play out in such a way that's like, this really is like the best possible D&D &D campaign you could ever play, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Only one person actually dies. Yeah, yeah, right? Well, I mean, of the of the party, I mean, you know, there's other deaths. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people die. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, like, if you're watching just the first movie and you don't know the story, then Boromir and Gandalf die in the first third of the campaign. That's true. Spoilers for books that came out, like, 80 years ago. Just, <laughs> if you didn't know. But then, like, the other flip side of though it's like man i am very inspired but holy cow i'm not jrr tolkien uh who boy so this interesting blend of inspiration but also the inadequacy that comes from that and like here we are we're, we're doing improv tabletop where the stakes couldn't be lower <laughs> and we have taken lord of the rings and what are we doing with it what we've created an unholy abomination that's all yeah yeah, yeah. so we're delving too deep and too greedily. But it, it is nice. We've had some opportunities with Improv Tabletop with the Avatar campaigns to get into some of those deeper, kind of more meaningful, long-term stories, which has been fun. Uh, we're getting more opportunities to do that on ImpTab Unpolished, especially like getting into our new Mouse Raider campaign, the Miceborn one, yeah. which there is still goofiness, but it definitely is leaning into some more of those serious aspects. 
So that is kind of my experience. Oh, also in preparation for this campaign, I watched uh, quite a few episodes of Courage the Cowardly Dog. Yeah! <laughs> that is the one that, uh, of my Cartoon Network raised friends, they that consistently is the one where they're like, this is the really, really good one. You should go back and check this one out. So I watched a few of those and uh, really enjoyed them. That is what I'm going to share for our ideation pot here. Let's go over to Caleb. You uh, seemed very incensed during my, uh, well, maybe incensed is not the right term, but you definitely felt some stuff during my ideation. All right, guys, here's the deal. Um, <laughs> at the start of this podcast, I said Hold on tight. that I was a huge Lord of the Rings fan. That may have been a gross understatement. Mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings is simply the best of any of the stuff that is out there, period. And if you think otherwise, you are entitled to your wrong opinion. <laughs> that being said, let's let's start at the beginning. Um, I definitely think I fell in love with The Hobbit through the animated Rankin and Bass Hobbit movie. Um, as a kid, watching that at like seven, maybe eight years old. And at that time, the movies were already being made and my dad knew they were going to be PG-13 and I begged my dad to let me go see them even though I was going to just barely have turned nine by the time they came out. And he said, all right, here's the deal. You can come watch them in theaters with me if you finish all the books. Ooh. And I was eight years old at the time. Laying it down. I had already read The Hobbit at that point multiple times and I went and I read all three of the Lord of the Rings trilogy before the time that I was nine years old. We'll just say by nine years old. Damn. Wow. I did it. And I went to see the Lord of the Rings in theaters. And that is one of my cherished childhood memories. Uh, really the only part that I felt traumatized by as a nine-year-old was the Bilbo hurrah moment that I know you guys all know the one that we're talking about. Scary Bilbo. <laughs> Scary Bilbo. <laughs> that was really the only thing. Dude, I'm remembering for me, the thing that most scared me, uh, even though like it's pretty mild looking back on it now, but when they're in the dead marshes and Frodo looks down and sees the guy and he opens his eyes, that yeah. freaked the heck out of me when I first saw him. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's getting into the two towers. Mm -hmm. Man, okay, so that was really like the beginning and it's all just been more Lord of the Rings and more nerddom from there for me. But Ned, I am absolutely shocked. So not only, like after seeing, in the, seeing them in theaters, we bought them and bought the extended editions the second that they came out. And it's rare that over a period of six months, I do not watch those films. They like, that is something that I'll go to. And I've, my wife had never seen them when we first started dating and I was like, you've never seen the Lord of the Rings. We, we got to change this. And I didn't have them with me at the time. And, but I had a roommate who had the, uh, it was only the theatrical editions. And I was like, it's not the extended editions, but you know what? We got to get this quick. Otherwise, I don't know if this relationship can continue. So we just got those ones and we watched them. And ever since then, I've gotten her on the train as well of every six months or so, she's like, it's been a while since we've watched Lord of the Rings. We should do that. And I'm like, yes. So honestly, those are just kind of constantly in the rotation. Always. I'm always watching those movies. The Fellowship is definitely my favorite. I, the others are great and I love them. I love them all. And I love how Peter Jackson made all three films at once because it just makes for, it doesn't even feel like any time has passed or anything it's just one big story but for me i am always a sucker for the beginning part of a story when everything is getting set up when the hobbits meet aragorn in the prancing pony and they don't even know who he is they don't even know his name he's just strider and the black riders aren't even the nazgul yet they're just black riders like these everything is they're just getting the inkling of a bigger world and bigger things going on outside the Shire. I love it. I love that stuff so much. I could literally talk about the Lord of the Rings for, you know, the entirety of this campaign, like all four episodes, but I won't. I will I will cut it short. Um, Patrons, if you want to hear the hour-long Caleb Lord of the Rings rant, make sure you subscribe. <laughs> Let us know. That's right. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just record it sometime, Ned, on my own and just send it to you. <laughs> nice. Um... I, I mean, there's there's so much. I'm having trouble because there is so much I could talk about and want to talk about, but I'm trying to keep it brief. The, could it fill three books? Probably. <laughs> the short and long of it is, huge Lord of the Rings fan. I love Lord of the Rings. 
Um, by the way, I just started a project uh, that I'm calling Operation Hobbit Door, Ooh. where we needed to replace our locks, and so we went out and we got a new, uh, it's, it's not actually a Hobbit Door, but we got a new doorknob, and of course I got a shiny brass one. Of course. And I was like, this door needs to go from a boring black on the outside door, white on the inside door, to being a Hobbit door. So I went and I picked out the perfect Hobbit green paint, and I painted half of it so far, and it's beautiful. I love having my bright green, shiny brass knob Hobbit door. It's wonderful. That's awesome, dude. Oh, by the way, that's another thing I could say. The Hobbit movies, absolutely not. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate them. I can't stand them. I, I have, hard no. I, it is a hard no. I have tried <laughs> so many times, and I want to like them so much, and I can't. It's not the same. They did not, the integrity that they built up in the original trilogy did not hold up. There are many, many reasons for that, and if you want to talk about it, then hit me up, send me a message, I don't know, call me, whatever, <laughs> we can talk about it. But The Hobbit's an absolute no for me, and I, I can't, I don't even, yeah, it's not the same. I want to like them, but for me and for my children, they've already seen the Rankin and Bass animated Hobbit. That's the version of The Hobbit they see, and when they're old enough, they will watch The Lord of the Rings. So that's that's that. Okay, on to cartoons. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, I don't have a ton of experience with early Cartoon Network. My parents were the kind that we did not have TV in our house. Like, we had no cable. We had no... Like, we had a TV, and we would watch movies and things like that. And we, we made regular trips to Blockbuster to, you know, if we needed new movies and things like that. So that's what we did. And really, my only experience watching, like, actual Saturday morning cartoons or anything like that was if I went over to a friend's house or to my grandma's house. Uh, but yeah, Cartoon Network, one thing that I do remember that came to my mind, uh, Thomas, you brought up Samurai Jack. I've never seen Samurai Jack, but I'm sure I would like it because I love the early 2D Clone Wars animated like miniseries. Yeah, I absolutely love that, and I know it's the same guy who did the who did those. Yeah, Gennady D. Tartakovsky. Yeah, I love those. Those are canon to me. I love the 2D <laughs> miniseries. That's fantastic. Oh yeah, I think the Clone Wars is actually an early 2000s Cartoon Network show. <laughs> I think we could have Star Wars in this technically. Oh boy, <laughs> I'm gonna look it up real quick. Hold on. Oh, we we have just. Opened up the floodgates. Clone Wars Cartoon Network. I'm going to be playing as Mace Windu. <laughs> it came out in 2003, so it counts. But Clone Wars is an early 2000s Cartoon Network TV show. Wow. This is specifically produced by Lucasfilm and Cartoon Network Studios for Cartoon Network. Wow. Okay. Pre-Disney purchase. The, the 2D Clone Wars. Yeah, the 2D one. Release okay. date November 7th, 2003. Okay, well, that, that puts in some options. <laughs> anyway. So if anyone here wants to be Count Dooku, I guess that's an option. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't have a ton of experience with that. I'm rather lacking on that part, but hopefully my too greedily and too deep knowledge of the Lord of the Rings can help us <laughs> out here between the films and the books. So yeah, that's where I'm going to cut it off. If I think of more, I'll probably say it, because that's how this goes. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Let's see. Let's pass it on over to Thomas. Hot diggity dog. All right, so this is going to be a while. Um, <laughs> I watched a lot of Cartoon Network as a kid. I mean, I watched a lot of cartoons, just period. But Cartoon Network was definitely the one I felt most at home with. I loved Kids Next Door. Billy and Mandy was crazy. A very weird show if you haven't watched it, but highly recommend it. Um, of the early 2000s ones, the only one I didn't watch was Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Um, and that's because my mom specifically banned it in the house. I still don't know why. I don't know what it was about Ed, Ed, and Eddie that was just a no-go, but she was not down for it. So uh, I've since watched a fair bit, and even when I was a kid, I snuck sneakily watched some of it. But uh, officially speaking, I didn't watch all Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Uh, Courage, however, is probably the best of those early shows um, with, like, Dexter's Lab in a close second. Um, it was just bonkers. I mean, <laughs> Courage the Cowardly Dog. It, it, if you don't know anything about Courage, understand this. It was super weird and had monsters that were far beyond a, a TV Y7 rating. Um, I feel like most people probably know about uh, Ramses, Return the Slab, all that jazz. 
Nope. Neither, oh, of course. Yeah. Of course, you guys don't know about it. So, <laughs> you have you heard anyone ever go, Return the slab. I don't. Or suffer my curse. Nope, never. Okay, so <laughs> it was... I, I'm, I'll send a gif. I'm going to put it in the patron discord so that they won't know what's going on. <laughs> but you guys will, because I'm... I'm positive I can find a gift for that in 30 seconds. Return the slide. I mean, I'm familiar with the Egyptian, like... Yeah, there it is. That It's already up. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at it now. That took no time. So that, that was, like, probably the most famous monster that Courage ever fought. But Courage was so cool, because he was just this little scaredy cat purple dog who inevitably has to fight all sorts of freaky things. Like, at one point, he fights banana people, and they get peeled, and it's a whole thing. Um, he fights a foot fungus that takes over Eustace and turns into, like, a mafia group. None of this is made up or exaggerated, for the record. <laughs> like, a foot fungus that takes over Eustace and becomes a giant foot. It's disgusting. And Eustace is? Uh, the oh, Well, one of the owners. Muriel and Eustace own Courage. Okay. Um, but only one of them really cares about Courage. Muriel loves Courage. Eustace hates Courage. <laughs> that return the slab gif is way freakier than I expected. Um, anyway, yeah. All sorts of crazy things. They fight aliens, ducks, banana people, foot fungus. They fight a shadow at one point, who turns out to be a kind of cool guy once you go and talk to him. Um, anyway, point is, Courage was bananas. It was it was very much just a, let's see how freaky we can get with it show. I loved it. Um, fingers crossed, no one takes Courage, because I'd like to be Courage for this. Oh, there we go. It's claimed. So <laughs> Courage the Cowardly Dog is a Monster of the Week campaign? Essentially, yeah. Like, that's the best way to phrase it. It's Monster of the Week um, because there's not really internal consistency. Occasionally, you get some background from Courage's, like, past, but there's really nothing there. He was adopted as a puppy at the end. <laughs> um, it Very good. I could probably rant about Courage forever, but I'm not going to. Apparently, I'm going to have to be the cartoon guy for this, so we got to branch out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Billy and Mandy, if, you, if you've ever watched like Chowder or uh, Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack or any of those other shows from later 2000s Cartoon Network that were always like really close-up, gross-out like pictures of people, they were inspired by Billy and Mandy. Like They started all that freaky stuff. And it, it was a whole other time period. I don't know how old are the people w listening to this are, but if you weren't there, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, Does it make sense if you were there? Not really, but it was fun. <laughs> I knew that. Yeah, I I don't know. I could rant on it forever. Uh, it, I really could. But I'm going to switch to Lord of the Rings because that one is easier to have a cohesive thought since it's one piece of media instead of like 30. <laughs> so Lord of the Rings... The first time I read it was when I was eight as well, actually. Yes! But I did not have incentive to watch the movies because I didn't know about them. I didn't know about the movies until I was, like, 15. Wow. So I, I didn't get any of that until I was older. But I, I read the first Lord of the Rings, or the Fellowship of the Ring, when I was eight, and then I read the later books. Zero reading comprehension. I didn't actually <laughs> know what was going on with it until later because I reread them a bunch of times. And even for this, I, I reread the Fellowship I started last week and I finished it about 30 minutes before we started recording. Um, wow. I just, I love the books. They're awesome. I, I could, I do end up going back to them all the time. Same. And it's like a family affair because the, the copy I have is of an old box set with The Hobbit that my dad got when he was a kid. And I was looking in it, the, the one I'm holding in my hands as we're recording this, let me check so I'm not a liar. Uh, it says copyright 1965. Nice. So like old book. And it's got my dad's name in it, right at the back. Look at that. No one else can see this, but it's there. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, Lord of the Rings has been a part of my life as as soon as I could read, essentially. And it's never really left. I remember watching the Rankin and Bass Hobbit when I was a kid. Uh, I still haven't watched the Lord of the Rings cartoon, but maybe one day. <laughs> yeah, that one's interesting because the Rankin Bass one is only the Return of the King. Mm -hmm. And there was a completely separate thing. Uh, Ralph Bakshi, who is a quite a director uh, did an animated version of Fellowship of the Ring and the first half of the Two Towers. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So there's the second half of the Two Towers that has never been officially animated. Uh, the Ralph Bakshi one, that is, it's wild. Uh, Good or bad wild? Uh, <laughs> weird wild. Weird wild. Up to interpretation. That was like the early days of like rotoscoping and like yeah. tracking real like people and putting them into cartoons and things like that. So there's a lot of that with, like, the Black Riders, and it's weird. <laughs> yeah, there'll be some scenes where it's, like, the orcs are attacking, and it's just, like, actual footage of people dressed up as orcs 
but really, like, the light levels are really messed with. Yeah. And they just draw, like, glowing eyes and fangs on them, yes. essentially. Nice. It's, it's weird. It's super weird. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I watched the cartoon Hobbit. That's it as far as the cartoons go. Um, and much like Caleb, a few times a year we end up watching the Lord of the Rings Extended Edition. And for a long time we pirated it. Um, <laughs> because, you know, why buy media? You wouldn't steal a handbag. But for Christmas, the missus did get me all three extended editions on Blu-ray. So yes. we watched them in their high definition quality for the first time, like <laughs> yes. a month or two ago. <laughs> so it does make a difference. Really good when you watch them, not on some Russian website. Um, <laughs> the movies are incredible. I don't think anyone's going to contend that. But the books are even better. Mm -hmm. If you've not read it, I can speak to this with, with authority. I just finished reading it. <laughs> it. Like, I just finished reading The Fellowship. And it is... Like, the movies are amazing. The books are better. Yeah. It's just a whole other animal. I mean, you never even hear about Tom Bombadil in the uh, the movies. And I get why they cut him. But, like, <laughs> it, it adds a whole other layer of magic and history and just depth to this world that, that the movies, just by virtue of being a movie, can't actually contain or reach or show you. So I, I highly recommend it. There's a bunch of other stuff too, but Tom Bombadil's the biggest example of that because he takes up a, a solid like quarter of the book. Yeah, um, it's a lot. So yeah, big fan of the books. Read them if you haven't. I'm begging you. You can you can fight me if you want. If you read the books, I will give you a one way ticket to where I live. We can get in a fist fight. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. You thought you could beat a bear. I don't know if I want to fight you. I <laughs> learned that I could not beat a bear. <laughs> I watched a video of two bears fighting each other, and I think I would be paced by like the ten second mark of that video. <laughs> I will just jump in with a slight comment. You need to approach the books in a different way than you do the movies. It's a very different ride. But by the time you get through with it, that's one reason I love the movies so much is I feel like it's the most successful book to film adaptation that has ever been done. Agreed. And they hang on to so much of the heart and so much of what Tolkien was writing and the messages that come across in this book. And they convert it so well and that's and yeah all the widow workshop stuff had so much to do with that but anyway you got to approach the books the different way don't expect it to be like a you know shot for shot of the movies because it's not but once you finish it absolutely i agree it is the same story and it's better honestly the fellowship of the ring is pretty darn close to shot for shot oh if yeah you cut the tom bombadil section and change a few characters it is almost shot for shot <laughs> it's true so good. Anyway, they're beautiful. They define the fantasy genre. I was arguing with Christian about this earlier. <laughs> and I mean, you cannot create a fantasy genre anything without someone comparing it to The Lord of the Rings. And it's for good reason. So I love it. I'm excited to do this. I love cartoons and Cartoon Network. So I'm excited for that aspect as well. And apparently I'm going to be the guy doing a lot of cartoon references. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to temper my Lord of the Rings stuff. Well, going to the other person on the other side of this fantasy novel argument, Christian, what you got for us? Yeah, and you know, I, I don't want to have people coming for my throat, but I got to stand by what I said. I, I do, I love Lord of the Rings. I think it is the great predecessor to all fantasy. It is the foundation on which all of this nerdy kind of stuff is built. It's so good. It's foundational and amazing. And as I said before, and this is where I think I might get the, uh, the tar and the feather out, it is foundational. I think every aspect of it has been done better since then. Maybe not as a whole unit, you know, but if you love the world building in Lord of the Rings, someone's done it better since then. If you love the way magic is done, someone's done it better. If you love, you know, prose is a little bit more subjective and stuff like that. But I, that being said, I love Lord of the Rings. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying <laughs> <laughs> that one thing is better than Lord of the Rings. Um, to me, it's just very foundational. And I think because I, the, my first experience was the animated Hobbit. Then it was the movies. And I didn't read the books. Technically, depending on how pedantic you want to get, I still have never read the books. I did the audiobook version. That counts. That, I say it counts. <laughs> this coming from a person who makes money narrating audiobooks. So I think that's a pretty authoritative opinion. It absolutely counts. Definitely counts. He's like, it definitely counts. It definitely counts. I think it counts more than real books. It should only be audiobooks. <laughs> um, but I didn't, I didn't experience the actual books until 
a year or two ago. Like really real? recent. Yeah, really recently. Holy cow. Wow. So what'd you think? I really enjoyed them. That being said, and this is probably why I view it a little bit differently, it wasn't my first exposure to fantasy. It wasn't my first like, oh, this is this is what can be done. At that point, I'd already read all of Brandon Sanderson's work. I'd already read The Wheel of Time. Yeah. Um, I'd been consuming fantasy media like a madman. So I was so familiar as opposed to being like, this is my first exposure. This is the foundation. This is where it all started. It felt like, oh, I can see where all these other pieces of media were inspired from. And since it's not my first exposure, like, Again, I feel like I feel like I'm gonna get <laughs> thrown under the bus for this. I love Lord of the Rings. I, Christian, I can absolutely see where you're coming from. Like I said at the beginning, you're entitled to your wrong opinion, but I can see <laughs> exactly where you're coming from. Here's one of the things, though, is that Tolkien wrote. I mean, in in his lifetime, obviously, there's been a lot of stuff published by Christopher Tolkien since his death and things like that. But he really wrote four books in a world where he could have written hundreds. And it feels a bit untapped in that way. And I do see how you can, you know, view it as a foundational fantasy. As far as fantasy goes, the cool thing is, and I think the thing for me that stands out, I'm sorry, this is an ideation. This shouldn't be a debate. But um, <laughs> It could be two things. <laughs> but it's less about the fantasy. The fantasy is cool. And Tolkien was the first one to really do that. But honestly, his books especially are less about the high fantasy and more about the morals and the lessons and the examples of courage and strength and the good of human nature and things like that. So I, they're more literary than they are fantastical. There's yeah. more going on. But I, I'm not going to tar and feather you. I totally see what you mean. <laughs> well, and I do need to go back and read it because I was in a mindset where I was looking for more like the fantasy. I need to go back and read it and appreciate it for what it is as a piece of literature. Um, but that being said, I am very familiar with it. I've seen all the extended editions. I've seen the originals. I've seen the animated Hobbit. I, I actually enjoy the Hobbit movies for what they are, being silly ridiculousness. But Lord of the Rings, I am comfortable with. Like we said at the beginning, Cartoon Network specifically, I am not. I actually, before this started, I was uh, talking to McKenna and I was like, I need to come up with a thing because I thought it was just early 2000s, 90s cartoons. And even that I was feeling a little bit unsure about. And so I was thinking, oh, Rugrats, Wild Thornberries. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, more Nickelodeon kind of stuff. That's more what I was familiar with. Are you going to try and be Arthur in this campaign? I was actually <laughs> considering doing uh, Nigel Thornberry. <laughs> <laughs> the Tim Curry campaign lives. Yes. As, as a Tim Curry. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't be disappointed. <laughs> Well, and you know, that may still be on the table, depending on how things crumble here, because my thing is to still do early cartoons. I could do Nigel Thornberry, but I am familiar with a lot of Cartoon Network shows, but really only the more recent ones. Steven Universe, mm. Adventure Time, The Regular Show. Those are shows that I've watched every episode of, and I do really appreciate. For me, there's a grotesque. And I mean that in like the artistic sense, there's yeah. a grotesqueness <laughs> to like Courage the Cowardly Dog, Mandy and Billy or whatever Billy that one was. Man the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, my man. <laughs> you say that with respect. The Mandy and whatever? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but yeah, like that and then Flapjack and um, those other ones, there is there is that. And even SpongeBob sometimes, then that's more Nickelodeon, but like yeah. there's a grotesqueness to it that never appealed to me. And so that's why I never really got into those earlier things. And mind you, you know, you still see some of that in Adventure Time, you know, uh, Stephen Universe and the regular show, but less less so than a lot of those other ones. Yeah, I think the early ones are more of a surreal grotesque, whereas the later ones are more of an abstract grotesque. Yeah. And so I could either go, I could be a, a gym in the world of Tolkien and be from outer space and have some powers there, or I could be... Nigel Thornberry. <laughs> yeah, I guess we'll yeah we'll look at if uh, <laughs> if early two thousands Cartoon Network specifically isn't quite your jam. Maybe we can see which direction you're going to take a step away from. Maybe it's yeah. early twenty tens Cartoon Network. Maybe it's early two thousands Nickelodeon. Oh man, if you open up early twenty tens Cartoon Network, you can be anyone in regular show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I could be I could be Rigby. I could just be ham boning through Middle Earth. <laughs> ham boning. <laughs> 
don't know if my recording picked that up, but I was just going nuts. <laughs> Caleb looks so out of his depth right now. I've never seen an episode of the regular show. Dude, regular show. I, for Caleb's sake, Caleb, go watch just like the first couple episodes of regular show. You'll know if you like it by then. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I also will not be disappointed at all if you are... I'd know skips or high five go, Steve. <laughs> or muscle man. My mom. <laughs> I might be disappointed if you play muscle man. But regardless. Um shoot, that's that's all of us, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. It's a longer ideation than normal, I think. We've but... been going for forty minutes just talking about Lord of the Rings, basically. <laughs> We've barely touched on cartoons. There's so much that's so great about uh, Lord of the Rings. I mean, it came out, I think also. It was just such a golden age for being a geek because yes. that was like one of the first big surges of meme culture online. Yes. We're like, this is where we get Boy the Mash and Stick in a Stew and they're taking the Hobbits to Isengard. Yes. A lot of the early Flash animators making like their own fan movies. Uh, 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 how it should have ended. Yeah. Like, Lord of the Rings, oh, yeah. I think, started how it should have ended. They were big on that. So, man, it's this is, I feel like, the past couple campaigns we've done where we did Star Trek, we did James Bond, those are the kinds of things where even if you've never watched them, they're so ingrained into our culture because they were so big in the cinematic space. Lord of the Rings, even if you haven't seen it, is so ingrained into our culture largely because of internet memory mm -hmm. in many ways. So, yeah, I think that's interesting. Just an interesting follow-through. That's neither here nor there. <laughs> we're going to figure out who our character is. That is both here and here, man. <laughs> fair, 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 fair. <laughs> so let's go around and figure out who our characters are going to be. I think Thomas probably has the strongest ground to stand on to start us off. So before we did this, I know we're not supposed to prepare, but I watched one episode of just like a few different Cartoon Network shows. We watched Johnny Bravo, Billy and Mandy, Courage, and Ed and Nettie, because I don't know what voices I can do. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I wanted to see what if, what I could even pull off. Um, Very valid. I really wanted to be Beast Boy from Teen Titans, because my plan was to be Beast Boy and then eventually turn into one of the the big winged beast because he can turn into animals that he sees Oh, because that would be so cool which I believe I think the the commonly associated term for the be the beasts that the Nazgul ride is the fell beasts yeah I believe that's the term it is though they're also called Nazgul birds I think is one of the options something like that yeah but I can't do Beast Boy's voice. I can't even get close. So I I instead opted for Courage the Cowardly Dog. Yeah. Because uh, he is really easy to do. He actually doesn't talk a ton. Um, he usually goes, and then he shapeshifts into whatever he's trying to explain. Um, just briefly. Like There are episodes where he just turns into a spaceship for a second to show like there's aliens outside. Mm -hmm. And that felt a lot easier for me to do. So I want to be Courage. A, because I like courage, and B, because I can make dog noises a lot better than people noises. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, if we're trying to find a high-concept aspect for Courage the Cowardly Dog, what do you think it is? The things I do for love. <laughs> he says that all the time in the show. Things I do for love. Like, he does, he's, I mean, he's the cowardly dog, but he is always rushing into danger to save Muriel from whatever monster happens to be in the house that week. I'd argue that that's a fantastic theme within the Lord of the Rings itself. Yeah, seriously. I was thinking about that, too, because, like, Frodo doesn't want to go out there. Mm -hmm. He just wants to stay home and chill out. And the things he did for love, I guess, of the world. Yeah. <laughs> That's the vibe that I love with Courage is he always starts the episode being like, how the heck do I get out of this? And then in the end, it's like, well, everything else has failed. So I guess I have to step in and save everybody. <laughs> it's got to be me. <laughs> the things I do for love. All right. What's something that gets Courage in trouble? Um, I mean, he is really a fr Eustace. Eustace gets him in trouble. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that is Eustace true. Is trouble? <laughs> Eustace, so you guys don't know Eustace, but he's the husband of Muriel, and he hates courage, and he routinely will pull out just like a big spooky mask or giant eyeballs and go, ooga, booga, 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 to try and scare the crap out of courage. <laughs> like, it's it's in the introduction to the show. He goes, stupid dog, you made me look bad. And then he goes, woo, woo, and courage screams and runs off. <laughs> yeah. So I think Eustace is my trouble. <laughs> Eustace. He's just going to be like part of the fellowship, and you're dragging him along with you. <laughs> always there. Oh no. <laughs> he's the he's the Boromir. <laughs> I would like you just to be my trouble if that's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll allow it. All right. Uh, now we're going to get some audience suggestions. And we got a whole bunch of good ones this time. I put a whole bunch in. I don't know if that's allowed since I'm in it. <laughs> uh, you did put in some very good ones. So I tried not to take too many of your okay. suggestions, but we got a few of them in here. 
the ones that you're going to get to choose from are, is that in the animation budget? <laughs> I like less than half of you twice as much as you deserve. And that still only counts as one. Ooh. Oh man, that's tough. I like less than half of you twice as much as you deserve. <laughs> that's on brand. All right. And now the last thing we need for courage is a stunt and or piece of equipment. Um, so in courage, they, so they live in the middle of nowhere in a farmhouse and like the place they live is called the middle of nowhere to be clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the name of the, the town they live is nowhere. And it's just one house and it's desert as far as you can see. But in the attic, they do have a computer <laughs> And he, he routinely will go up to the attic when there's a problem be like, how do I get rid of shadows? And the computer will <laughs> yell at him in British. So you can ask a question. Yeah, so I think the computer is my, my equipment. Nice. And then last thing we're going to get for you, what do you think Courage's peak approach is going to be? Careful. He is careful. That makes sense. Very cautious. He doesn't want to do anything scary, so. That sounds on brand to me. All right. Now, between our other two, Caleb and Christian, do either of you feel strongly about the direction you want to go? Not yet. I I am now very torn since we started talking because I was like, yeah, I'll just be Nigel Thornberry. First off, my Tim Curry isn't very good. <laughs> I mean, you're not Tim Curry. <laughs> just go <laughs> smashing, darling. <laughs> smashing. Like, you know, Nigel has a very distinct thing. But you guys said Rigby, and Rigby is Cartoon Network, and that feels a little... Oh, my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> Why is she going to kill you? Because she loves regular show. I do, too. Like, we've watched the whole thing through a few times, but I, I didn't pick that, so... I think I'm going to be Rigby, and I think now it's funny. We have a little dog and a little raccoon. That feels good to me. Okay, uh, what do you think Rigby's high concept aspect is going to be? Well, here's the problem. I think Rigby's high concept is best summed up the moment every time between Rigby and Mordecai where they go, oh, that feels like his high concept, but that's not a, that's not a, I mean, I can't just say, oh, is my high concept. I mean, if you play as Mordecai and Rigby, <laughs> I'm two characters. I mean, Connor did it. There is precedent for two characters played by one person. I'm just throwing that out there. I think my high concept for Rigby is going to be, um, stop talking. Stop talking! Stop talking! <laughs> That's just the thing he says the most. That's perfect. That's so good. And he's, he's just like, there's going to be, I mean, it's Lord of the Rings. He's going to be so confused. People are going to be talking a lot, doing big monologues. You know, the, the Council of Elrond. He's like, look, stop talking. I'm going to go do this. <laughs> My wife and I routinely, when we're talking to each other, we'll just go, stop talking and walk away. Oh, man. I'm realizing now that so far we have two characters who are just like small bundles of anxiety. They yeah. just vent their anxiety in very different ways. <laughs> Well, it sounds like Courage is actually a good guy, and Rigby eventually becomes a good guy, but definitely doesn't start out as one. Maybe he's our Boromir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do you think gets Rigby in trouble? Oh, it, too many things. I think Lazy is huge. Mordecai. Mordecai. Anger issues. Anger issues. Oh, what's his older brother's name? Oh. Or his younger brother, who's just like a straight brick house? Don, right? Don. Don. Or Benson. Benson might be a good one. Um, no, I think, I think I'm going to go with... Um, I'm going to go with lazy. Yeah, that's pretty fair. Yeah, I think lazy is fitting. Okay. Uh, now, audience suggestions for Rigby. Uh, what's in your pockets is <laughs> sugar, spice, and everything nice, but they were all of them deceived for another ingredient was used. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. Good evidence. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't carry it for you, but I can steal it from you. <laughs> oh, my word. <sighs> I got to go with that last one. That is very rigged. I was going to say, it's not my character, but you have to pick that, man. <laughs> yeah. No, I have. Because, like, the sugar and spice one is that's poetry right there. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this one just fits Rigby so perfectly. Nice. And now we need a stunt for Rigby. I kind of wanted to have it be punch of death. Yeah. Or maybe block of death or jump of death. Maybe he has a Playco arm boy. Play That's his piece of equipment. Um, or maybe a magical electronic keyboard. The power. The power. Remember rig juice? Rig juice? Yeah, rig juice. Wow, we are, we are delving deeper into regular show than we delved into like anything else. Yeah. Regular show's great. <laughs> too greedily and too deep. <laughs> yep. Um, can my stunt be skips? <laughs> I mean, I feel like Skips does come and save their lives a if lot. If I just need something really, really badly, I just have Skips do it for me. You just call in the Deus Ex Machina? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Skips can be your stunt. We've got Eustace as Courage is Trouble. Okay, I like it. Okay, and what do you think is going to be Rigby's peak approach? 
It's got to be flashy. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Can I put zero everywhere else? Because <laughs> I'm just flat. I mean, if we're cartoon characters, we should have high highs and low lows. No, I, sh I should I should put it out. But uh, yeah, he's he's doesn't he's not good at anything else. All right, there's Courage and Rigby, and now Caleb. What would you like to do? I'm so excited. I'm I'm struggling, guys. So here's the thing: we've got you guys as two really crazy cartoon characters. There, there's a few things that I could go with here. I feel like I could go with just straight up Lord of the Rings, and you guys might need a Gandalf to, like, guide you, maybe. You just straight up actual Gandalf? I could just, yeah, be actual Gandalf. Like not a cart... I could be the cartoon. I could be, like, the, you know, uh, Rankin and Bass Gandalf. Gandalf means me! That's very different from me and McKellen's Gandalf. <laughs> yeah! We could do that. I mean, that that feels like a decent compromise. Yeah? Yeah. I could do that. Cartoon Gandalf? Cartoon Gandalf, specifically. I think that's what I'm gonna do. Let's do- I like that. I hope, really hope we meet live-action Gandalf, too. <laughs> just two Gandalfs in this universe. Dude, oh, I'm just realizing this is the second time somebody's played Gandalf in Improv Tabletop, because JP did it for Taika's Fun Punch Club. Oh, no, my te word. Technically, he played Sir Ian McKellen. He did, he yeah. He yes. Sir Ian McKellen. But he did think he was Gandalf. He did. And that should count for something. I think, don't let that dissuade you from playing Gandalf. I just think it's really <laughs> awesome, because I love Ian McKellen so much. I mean- I would probably be more comfortable doing an Ian McKellen Gandalf than the animated Gandalf, but I feel like I need to stick with the cartoon bit at least a little bit. So that's, I'll leave that up to you guys. What do you think? I like the it's idea. It's not our character. You pick it, man. Just be Gandalf. Whatever Gandalf speaks the most to you in the moment, I suppose. Here, I, I actually I have an idea. Your stunt can be that you can switch between live action and cartoon Gandalf. <laughs> oh my gosh. I freaking love that. For the really dramatic moments, you go you go live action. Oh my gosh. That way, you can just, whatever you're feeling at the moment, you can go, you shall not remain animated. <laughs> and your live action Gandalf. Gosh, I love it. I'm doing it. I'm doing that. <laughs> but the problem is, when you do that, I turn into a raccoon, just a regular raccoon, and he just turns into a regular oh, dog. You can just switch the entire world. <laughs> Some world-bending stuff going on. I just turn into a regular scared dog. It's like in uh, Enchanted, when she gets sent to New York and Pip just turns into a regular chipmunk. <laughs> that would be really cool, actually. I don't know if that's allowed, but I would be down for that. I think I'm going to do that as my stunt. All right. I will leave it up to Ned to see if it affects just me or if it affects everybody. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll, we'll adjudicate it in the moment depending on what I think is most interesting. Or funniest. Okay, <laughs> uh, what do you think Gandalf's high concept aspect is? There's a lot about Gandalf. There's so much about Gandalf. Yeah, there is. <laughs> Gandalf is me. Yeah, that's I mean, his high concept. I am Gandalf. Gandalf means me. Fool of a took. It's just yeah, fool of a took. Oh, that's gonna be his trouble. Absolutely, is Pippin. Pippin is Gandalf's trouble. Pippin oh, is we his all trouble. Have, okay, so we're a party of six. We're a party of six. Is we're what gonna you're build the fellowship ourselves. <laughs> oh yeah. wait, yeah, we could each have for two of our aspects uh, a character, <laughs> and that would be nine people in the fellowship. Well, I'll bring in the other three. I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll figure yeah. out who that's going to. Yeah, so his trouble is just Pippin. Pippin. <laughs> Pippin is his trouble. I haven't even landed on a concept yet, but we've definitely established <laughs> what the problem is. Yeah. I mean, it could be look to the first light of the fifth day. Ooh, I like that. Some who live deserve death or don't deserve death or something like that. Mm -hmm. And some who die deserve life. That quote, honestly, might be a good high concept. You could be conjurer of cheap tricks. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> word. I am no conjurer of cheap tricks. I like that. Man, okay, I mean, we've got the Wandering Wizard is basically kind of, you know, that covers a lot of different things. We've got what he actually is. I mean, he he's specifically a Maiar who's come down to yeah. complete the task of keeping Sauron at bay. I mean, Gandalf, he is just so all-encompassing, like, as a force of nature. Maybe Gandalf means me is just, like, the best way to define who Gandalf is. <laughs> I like it. Let's do it. Gandalf means me. All right. And now we have some audience suggestions for you. You have my comically oversized hammer. <laughs> hey, this is a kid's show. <laughs> or you shall not pass. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm doing you shall not pass. I got to take it. Yeah, you got to. What else was there, really? <laughs> yeah. All right. And we've already got your stunt. So now we need a peak approach for Gandalf. 
I mean, I'm thinking he's got to be clever, right? He is very clever. What else could it be? Yeah. I mean, he's a wizard. Wizards are intelligence-based casters. Yeah, <laughs> wizards exactly. are intelligence. I think you could argue forceful, because he can really get a point across. He but can, that's I, true. Yeah, clever makes sense to me. I'll put forceful and flashy up there pretty high as well, but I think clever's got to be the top one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, we've got all of our characters created, and whew, we've been recording for a while. <laughs> it's been, um, <laughs> been over an hour. Is this going to be our first three-episode story? Each episode can be a book. <gasps> we do the fellowship in the next episode, two towers in the next one, return to the king at the end. I mean, I'm in. I'm in. Oh, Let's beautiful. Do it. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, we're going to wrap up this introduction episode. Man, there's just some, like very legit sincere literary critique of lord of the rings in this episode which i really enjoyed anyway dear listeners thanks for joining us <laughs> we'll be back next time with more adventures in the world of return of the king if you want more go ahead and subscribe maybe even give us a review we would be as happy as i mean all of us are that we're getting to do lord of the rings if you would go ahead and give us a review on the podcatcher of your choice yeah no kidding uh, we're also all over social media at Improv Tabletop. So if you'd like to connect with us there, uh, maybe you want to talk with me about literary analysis of <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Though you'd probably honestly get a much better conversation if you were to ask Caleb or Thomas about it. Uh, but don't be afraid to reach out. We all love talking about this geeky stuff. Christian, you don't get to talk about Lord of the Rings because you're too big in Sanderson. That's, yeah, you already had your chance with my valid. It's valid. Hey, he's entitled to his wrong opinion. It's okay. <laughs> now, it's time to shout out our next batch of Sticker Club patrons. Yeah. <laughs> Who we got this week? We got Tim Russ. We got Tyson Lanzen. And we got Thomas Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, that last guy. Finally. <laughs> that last guy. Oh, boy. Oh, man. Uh, we'll say that Tim Rust and Tyson Lanzen are two of the good Maiar, and Thomas Ryan <laughs> is the Balrog. <laughs> I just, I just got to say, you guys dunk on me every time I come up, and I love it. Don't stop. <laughs> Good. I love it. Never stop dunking on me, okay? Wouldn't have it any other way. So, yeah, Tim Rust and Tyson lands and watched you fall from grace and fall <laughs> deep, deep, deep into a pit of flame of your own creation. And, you know, SMH, what else are you going to do? <laughs> we'll have more Sticker Club patrons to shout out next week. And if you, dear listener, want to join their ranks, consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash improv tabletop, where you can also get things like Discord access, biannual sticker packs, and more, such as our current ongoing patron-exclusive campaign, Miceborn, the Mouse Ritter Chronicles. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, there may be more people playing in that campaign who are also currently playing in this campaign than you might have suspected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. 100%. It's me. Yeah, having lots of fun over there. It's definitely the most preparation I've put into any campaign for this entire podcast. Wow, wow. I mean, I've made uh, one hex crawl and one dungeon, and that already is more preparation than I've put into any other campaign we've done. <laughs> the bare minimum for any other campaign. <laughs> yep. Oh, man. Let's go ahead and do a round of plugs. Uh, we'll just get our once monthly mention of fan roll dice out of the way. Not out of the way. That makes it sound like I don't care about this. I just, I, it makes me feel so corporate when I mention this one. But <laughs> fan roll dice. Uh, if you go to their website and use coupon code vroom vroom fifi, that's still the same coupon code that we've been using from all those years back. Vroom vroom. Uh, you can get 10% <laughs> off your order and some of those proceeds come back to us. Brand new dice, but the liquid core is your own blood. Ooh. You have to send in a sample of it. <laughs> um, for your next Curse of Strahd campaign, get your own blood liquid core of you. Horrifying. Yeah, we'll go with that. We'll go with that one. <laughs> Definitely something you can actually do. Yes, and. Yes, and. Definitely ethical. This is where we flash it on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> Legally, that's not something we do. <laughs> Please do not send your blood to fan roll dice. <laughs> just want to be really clear on that. <laughs> if you do, then we will it'll be too much power. We won't be able to resist it. You shall have a queen. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> We also have a sister podcast, I Cast Fireball. We are currently on hiatus from that, but we're preparing for, actually, by the time you're going to be listening to this, we will have already had our session zero oh, nice. for campaign two, Ooh. our nautical boat-based adventure that we've got coming up. Heck yeah. And we've also started uh, creating characters for another project that's oh. coming up in the near future. Ooh. But 
Mm. Other Thomas uh, doesn't like it when I spoil too much about iCast Fireball, so that's as much <laughs> as I'm going to say right now. And the last thing that I'm going to plug right now is uh, the French Laundry Cookbook. Uh, Thomas Keller is a really cool chef who opened a restaurant called the French Laundry, and I've been feeling very inspired by it. The French Laundry Cookbook is very well put together. The graphic design is great. The photography is great. Uh, the recipes are intimidating, <laughs> but I'm going to make some of them. So... Uh, that's just what I'm going to plug right now. Thomas Keller, he's a cool guy. Um, also, I'm going to plug a YouTube channel called Anti Chef. Uh, Jamie over there, he does series where he actually digs into these cookbooks and makes the recipes himself at home, which is what inspired me to get uh, this recipe myself. He does a lot of Julia Child stuff. That was kind of where he got his start. Yeah, really cool videos over there. Go check it out. Uh, Who? This has been a long episode. Thanks for <laughs> joining us, everybody, here on the world of Ratoon of the King. I'm Ned Wilcock, your host and GM, and I've been joined by... Caleb Anderton. Gandalf means me. Christian Randall. Stop talking! <laughs> and Thomas Ryan. The things I do for love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. Much love and stuff, everybody. We'll catch you next time on Improv Tabletop. You know what? I genuinely don't know if Rigby has a last name. To the internet. Rigby. Mordecai. I just looked it up. Mordecai, no, Mordecai is his friend. Yeah, it's his, oh. the big blue bird is Mordecai. See what I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I just want you to pick your character based on Googling. <laughs> yeah, just Google. <laughs> Cartoon Network small animal character. <laughs> Caleb, you could just be Obi-Wan Kenobi. I can mean, there's that. <laughs> Star Wars Honestly? Clone-, Clone Wars is explicitly early 2000s Cartoon Network. I-, I see nothing wrong with that choice. And it wouldn't even count as a Star Wars campaign, so we can do that later. <laughs> but do it. <laughs> oh, General Grievous. Oh, <laughs> General <laughs> Grievous. Just be coughing the whole time dude this is a sidebar but general grievous in the 2d clone wars is the best iteration of any general grievous oh yes <laughs> he's terrifying i never watched the 2d clone wars but is jar jar binks in it i don't think so oh that's a shame <laughs> but dude general grievous in the 2d clone wars is straight up like a monster from a horror film he is it's so good <laughs> uh but yeah okay more rigby rigby that's who we're talking <laughs> yeah, about sorry right totally off topic here <laughs>